Welcome back. We're going to do the solution video for lab 11 and I've got my R markdown set up. Basically what we have here is some numbers we're using for an X variable, some other numbers we're using for a Y variable, and let's get started on question number one. So we've got an X and Y variable containing those numbers and let's compute Pearson's R and report the associated P value using the core test function. So we should be able to do this one pretty easily based on what we learned in the lab. And there you go. So we can see the core, the Pearson's correlation here, and we've got a p-value. I'm gonna do a couple more things so that we can write it down in a sentence outside of this code chunk. So I will run the code chunk like this, surrounding this whole thing with parentheses so that when I knit it, um, I'm gonna print out the test just like this. I'm gonna save the contents of this test in this variable. So if I run this code chunk, we'll see my core pops up. And that means later on, when I wanna use the results in here to write something down, let's see the statistic. So that's the T value. And what is the estimate, I guess, is probably the correlation. All right, so we've got estimate and we've got P value And we can use these in a sentence, say right here. The correlation was, and maybe I'm gonna use the letter R just like this. I'm gonna add in a little, so that'll print out as a italics R. We did something like that. When we knit the document, we will see the values being printed out here. I'm gonna add the p-value right here. That didn't print out exactly like I wanted. I needed to identify this, we call this a code snippet, and I need to put a little R here. So that's what it would look like all on one line. Then when we print it out, oh, still didn't work. Ah, I messed up that. Here we go. Um, you might wanna deal with the decimals just gonna make another line here. I just copied this and put my numbers inside of the round function. And then I added digits equals two, so when it prints out, it rounds to two digits. Finally, here's an example using the Papa Jaw package and the APA print function. So I've just put our variable mycore containing the results of core test inside of this and I've asked it to print out the full result. And when we do that, you can see that uh, all of this stuff, the R value, some confidence intervals, the T value, the degrees of freedom, and the P value are printed out and they're all rounded appropriately for APA style. The next question here is to use a permutation test to create a null distribution and report the p-value for getting the observed correlation or larger using the simulated null distribution. So if you go back to the lab, go to the permutation test section, scroll down a little bit, we can see some code we can borrow. Here's an example of running a correlation between two variables, in this case, length and meaning. And uh, when we do this, we're resampling and shuffling the order of the numbers in length and same for the numbers in meaning. We compute the correlation uh, 
then and we replicate this 1,000 times to create 1,000 correlations reflecting the kinds of R values you could have got uh, across 1,000 different permutations of the orders of the values in those variables. The histogram shows that null distribution. So you could do something like just copy this code, head back over to your lab, and change length to x and meanings to y. So we're going to be resampling the values in these variables here. And let's just do that. OK, there's a null distribution that we made with the permutation test. We're being asked to report the p-value for getting the observed correlation or larger using your simulated null distribution. So the observed correlation is stored in my core under estimate. That's this value right here. Our null distribution is in sim rs. Let's find the values in sim rs uh, that are equal to, or sorry, greater than or equal to the correlation that we observed. So this will identify all of those values. But I'd like to know the proportion out of a thousand. So we can get the length of this. This tells us that there were 62 values that were greater than or equal to the one we found. And to translate that into a probability, we can divide by 1,000, which is the number of total simulations that we ran. And here is the probability value there. Just for my own curiosity, I noticed that the p-value here is a little bit smaller than this one. And we've done a one-tail test, mind you. And so that should be smaller. If you doubled it, you'd get something pretty close to what the p-value is from the t-test. All right, run number two. Using the variables x and y above, and assuming that the values could be reordered in any way, report the following. The smallest possible sum of cross products and the largest possible sum of cross products. I'm just going to delete this. I'm going to change this later. So it says sum of products on the website. There was a little bit of confusion on exactly what I was asking for. If we head back over to the lab and look at the concept number one, where we talked about the sum of products as a measure of correlation, uh, this is what we were talking about. If you have some numbers in x, 1 to 10, and y, and 1 to 10, you can plot them. You can see that there's a perfect positive correlation here. You can get the correlation, find it to be an r of 1. And uh, if you reverse the numbers, you get a negative correlation. You get a correlation of negative 1. If you do something really simple, so let's start with a positive correlation where both of the values are going from 1 to 10 exactly. If we calculate the products, that is multiply 1 times 1, 2 times 2, 3 times 3, and so on, and then we add them up, this is the sum of products we get, 385. And this is the largest sum of products you could possibly get with these numbers. There's no other way to order these numbers to get a larger sum of products. Similarly, if the values are in a perfect negative correlation, so that the smallest value is paired up with the largest value on the other variable and vice versa, the largest value on one is paired with the smallest on the other and everything in between. Uh, when you multiply these vectors and add up their products, you get the smallest sum of products. So here, we have an x variable that has these numbers. And we have a y variable that has these numbers. And we want to find out what is the smallest possible sum of products we could possibly get if these numbers in x and y were reordered in any way. And um, how should they be reordered? Well. If we do a sort on x, it will sort x from the smallest value to the largest value. 
we could do a sort on y, and it will do the same thing. Now, the values in x and y are lined up such that this um, smallest value is paired with the smallest value for each of them. Let's see, 1 and 1, 2 and 2, 3 and 3. When we get to the next value, uh, the next smallest value in x, a 3 is paired with the next smallest value in y, and so on. And at the very end, the largest value in x is paired with the largest value in y. So if we simply multiply these together, we have the products. And if we take the sum of these products, um, what we will get is the largest possible sum. And I realize here I've answered question B, the largest possible sum of products. So let's take that answer and pop it down here. For the po smallest possible sum, we're talking about a negative correlation. Let's start with sorting x, sorting y, and when we look at these ones, they're perfectly lined up. I'd like, let's say, y to be reversed. Let's go from 9 down to 1. And there is another option in the sort function. If you wanted to read the sort, sort function help file, you could do question mark sort, and you'll see that decreasing is a, uh, the, the default op option here is false. So we should infer that by default, we, we sort increasing from one up. So if we say decreasing equals true, then the variable the variable will get sorted in the other way. So now x is going up and y is going down, and the smallest in x is paired with the largest in y, and so on. So if we simply take these values, multiply them all together so that we get the products, we can add them up and get the smallest possible products that we could get. I'm going to knit my whole lab and make sure that it compiles without error, solves all the problems. And there we have it, the solutions to lab 11.